Hello everyone and welcome back to our discussion on how much land does a man need. Today we're going to be discussing the third section of our reading together. So before we dive in though, it's good to make sure that we have in the back of our minds what we've already discussed. So I want to recap part two, the last video with you. And we saw in those sections you had to read, so sections three and four in the previous video, that we come to certain conclusions about Pockham. And some of the big ones we came across was one, his inability to be content, right? That he gets 40 acres in his first community, but then when he begins to hear that there's more land to be had for cheaper, he immediately sells up everything and moves there. And this also points to his tendency for greed too, right? The fact that in throughout this story, right, uh, being content, right, sort of has this image of you, you don't seek for more, you don't have this greedy aspect of your personality. Right? But because of his inability to be content, Pockham has this sort of opening for greed in his life, constantly wanting more. And by this token, right, he's also easily swayed to move on to these bigger and better things, right, by certain characters that are, are present and characters who we get no backstory for. Right. Not that we're fully aware of the backstory of all of the peasants. Right. But recall the uh, tradesman who comes in. Right. And the other peasant before him. Right. They suddenly appear out of nowhere with promises of this land you can have for more and land that you can have for, for cheaper. Right. And then Pockham is easily swayed into just following whatever these strangers say. And in terms of our literary focus, we discussed three things in particular. The big thing we talked about was irony, both situational and dramatic. And we're going to see irony continue throughout the rest of the story. We also talked about repetition in terms of those key phrases that are, are repeated in the story and also particular plot points that we have this repetition of Pockham finally getting what he wants, striving for that better thing. And then once he gets it, this new opportunity sort of appears and he wants that instead. And then lastly, we talked about those supernatural elements. And I asked you to be aware of how we see supernatural elements pick up throughout the story. And this is going to be particularly important, right? It's been important throughout the text, but in our discussion for today in sections five, six, and seven. So that being said, you before going on in the rest of this video you should have made sure that you you read sections five six and seven of this story so if you're using your literature textbook that would have been pages 964 to 968 so please do make sure that you go ahead and read those before watching the rest of the video so let's go ahead then and dive into our analysis of sections five six and seven so in your reading of section five, again, we're looking always first to comprehension because that's how we know whether or not we've grasped the sort of the, the plot, right, that's going on. Because if we have no idea what actually happened in terms of plot, our analysis of the text is going to be one, really weak because we don't understand and, and two, sort of a fruitless effort. So again, looking first at this setting, we see that we're still in Russia, right? The entirety of the short story is going to take place there. But now we finally reach the land of the Bashkirs, right? This mysterious place that the dealer had told us about in section four. We're also introduced to a few new characters. So Pockham, although he's not new, right? We, we need to keep tabs on what he's doing as the central character. And we see that he heads to meet with the Bashkirs, and he takes a servant with him. And speaking of this servant, right, true to form in terms of how um, people in sort of higher positions are usually deemed to treat those beneath him, them, the servant is quiet, so it doesn't say anything, right, in the sections that we read, and is not even addressed really by Pockham himself, so treated as this secondary and almost invisible character. And then finally, we have the Bashkirs. So interestingly, right, we have no direct commentary from the narrator about how they view the Bashkirs and their lifestyle. And this is going to be interesting because that leaves more room for us than the audience to sort of give our own commentary about the lifestyle that they lead, which we're going to do in a moment. But also we get this image of a pleasant people 
who are really simple in terms of their needs and their lifestyles. Very sort of opposite or juxtaposed to what we see in Pockham. Moving on then to our analysis, the first thing I want to discuss is the theme in fiction. Because you remember we're talking about two literary elements essentially here as we read. One, the, the drawing conclusions that we've been doing, but also taking the way that we draw conclusions and linking them to the theme of the text. And one of the conclusions that we're going to use to help bolster our understanding of theme is the life of the Bashkirs themselves and the fact that they lead a life that really points to the theme of the story, very contrasting to the greed and all-consuming desire of Pockham. We have people who are, in a sense, are content with what they have, and they enjoy the little things in life. Some examples of that you should have seen in your reading, where they, they do little work. They enjoy food and drink, so the simple pleasures in life. They don't gather wealth. And and far from, from that, right, they're even generous with others giving away their wealth. And we're also going to talk about the conclusions we're continuing to make about Pockham. And in this section in particular, section five, we see that he's still very much focused on material goods. So, for example, this points to his greed. He wastes no time when he gets there in telling the Bashkirs what he wants and that he's come for their land. Right? He gives them the gifts that he's brought and he gets straight down to business really not even seeking to understand them as a people and their lifestyle. And also one thing I want to point out, because we're going to dive more into foreshadowing in this portion of the text, and the story, once we get to the end, you guys, it's going to be one of those stories that it catches you by surprise, but then in its beauty, right, the fact that we should have been seeing what was going on the entire time, and part of the way that we pay attention to, to foreshadowing right, and to what might happen later in the story are certain contradictions that we see in the text that are not contradictions where the author simply made a mistake, but contradictions that are put in there subtly so that we begin to understand what's going on. So, for example, in the beginning, this contradiction that exists in Pockham that we pointed out, the fact that he makes a boast that peasants are not sort of open to being tempted. But then in the very same scene, the very same breath, he himself unwittingly falls into the temptation of the devil, right? This contradiction that exists in his characterizing of peasants. And I want to talk about some contradictions that exist in the Bashkir camp itself. And the first one is that the text very clearly states that no one among them in the camp speaks Russian, but all of a sudden they have this interpreter, right? So we need to think just like we did with those other characters, the peasants and the dealer, right? Where do these characters come from? So for example, where did this interpreter magically show up, right? And also, although they are a simple people, right, we see that they fall into dispute when trying to decide whether to give Pockham this land for them, right, you know, outright, or whether to wait for the chief to tell them what to do. And we need to ask ourselves, right, so if they're really a simple people, they shouldn't be arguing over something like this, right? But also, right, where have we seen disputes arise before? So earlier in the text, in section two in particular, when we talk about the dispute that arises between the peasants in Paco's initial community, where they try to buy all of this land together, the text outright tells us that it's the devil, the evil one, who sows this discord and this dispute among them. So we need to be questioning ourselves, is this then the same example of that happening? Is this also, as it was before, the devil sowing discord among them? And if so, right, Paca needs to be very worried, right, because we, jumping back to dramatic irony for a moment, right, we know that the devil is playing into his hand and giving him all of this land for the sole purpose of bringing him down. Then we're going to jump to section six. And again, going through comprehension, we see that it's the same setting and we have pretty much the same characters, only now we also are introduced to the Bashkir chief. Okay, so again, speaking of characters who sort of mysteriously appear without any background, the chief just appears to, to solve the, the dispute among them. And so one thing to note, right, again, no one in this camp should be speaking Russian, but magically the chief is able to. 
So that should be something to sort of put us on pause. So it wasn't the fact that Tolstoy said this and then he forgot. He's doing this intentionally to wake us up. Like we should be very cautious of this character. And we also see that the chief is the one who makes this deal with Pockham for the land that he wants. And this is a, a deal, right, that conveniently plays into Pockham's greed, right? Uh, imagine saying to someone who constantly wants more, right, all you got to do is pay this little bit. And as much as you can gather for yourself in a day, it's yours, right? It's like you're asking them to try to, to get as much as they can. I don't know if any of you guys have seen the cartoon Cinderella movie back in like the 90s. There's a character, Gus Gus, and he's this mouse. And while they're trying to run away from this cat who wants to eat them, right, they, they drop all of these treats they've been gathering to, to eat. And Gus Gus is this mouse who is very fat. So he, he wants to gather up all these treats. He wants as many as he can get. But he gets to this point where he carries so many that he's unable to fit through this, this hole to safety, right? And this is the same imagery going on here, right? That we have this, this hint that perhaps Pockham then is going to bite off more than he can chew and it's going to cost him something. Moving on then to analysis, we continue to make conclusions about Pockham as a character. And surprise, surprise, we continue to see that he is a character driven by his greed. So, for example, in this section in particular, we see that although the chief agrees and they begin to make this deal, right, Pockham immediately shows a lack of trust towards them, right, despite what he's been told about the Bushkiers and their simplicity and their generosity. And he wants to make a, a deed right, this legal binding contract, that this land will be given to me, right, so showing not only just greed, but a lack of trust. Additionally, we also continue to see folktale elements. One of the folktale elements we've already talked about is the use of supernatural things in the story, namely the devil. But here we also see it in the deal itself. So, we, we constantly see the use of the deal, right, in folktale stories. And the deal is this, right? Although it looks different in each story, our central character is forced to face a certain condition or a certain requirement that they have to fulfill in order to get what they want, right? And so here we're going to see that Pockham, in order to get what he wants, he has to pay a thousand rubles a day and he has to be able to walk, right, in a full circle. And as much as he can walk in a day, that land is his. And so again, just to point something out, you guys, this thousand rubles is extremely cheap, right? Part of what draws Pockham in in the first place when he realizes he can get all of this for relatively little. And by the means of being very cheap and kind of convenient too, right? This has to walk. It's very enticing to Pockham, right? And again, it plays straight into his greed. So you and I, Right? As the audience, we should be seeing warning bells that unfortunately Pockham as our central character is unable to see as of yet. And this is where we come to foreshadowing. Now, you remember, foreshadowing is when we have hints or signs of something later to come in the story. And here, we see that these hints and signs are going to point to danger to come. Right? So as the story unfolds, we need to pay attention to what possible elements in the story could in fact be foreshadowing. So we've already seen that in this, in this story so far, right? The use of the dispute that always sort of happens, right? In the midst of Pockham being able to get what he wants and how we've already been warned that that first dispute was inspired by the devil himself. So when we see this dispute arise again, what's to say that this isn't the cause of the devil as well? And then Moving to section seven, okay, we see in terms of the setting that we're still in the same setting, but now we're in the evening, right, the day before the challenge is to take place, and we're going to look at our characters and see that Pockham has this dream about the true identity of the chief and the dealer and the peasant, right, and so some of you have been keenly aware of these characters throughout the story, and have been paying attention to where the heck they come from, this is warning bells for you, right? That these characters, as they turn out to be in the end of Pockham's dream, are all the devil himself, right? But Pockham, right, true to his character, unfortunately, 
completely ignores the signs, right? So as the reader, right, at this point, we're getting frustrated with Pockham. And we're getting frustrated in large part because of the fact that the devil makes this appearance in the dream. And this should cause us to question, as it should cause Pockham to question, has he truly been the one, right, playing these mysterious characters throughout the story itself? Turning then to analysis, jumping to foreshadowing. One of the things that we need to always do, especially in short stories, because they're able to make very, very good use of irony in particular, but also foreshadowing by means of its length, is the fact that certain things get repeated in the story, and they get repeated to draw our attention. And so here, you'll recall back in section six in your reading that in the midst of making this deal with Pockham, the chief laughs. And there's really no rhyme or reason for why he does this. The narrator doesn't explain why he laughs, and really the, the context of the story doesn't seem to make it fit. So it should have stood out as something odd to you, and for good reason, right? Because in Pockham's dream, this image of the laughing chief reappears, right? And the laughing, because ultimately we, we see in the dream the true identity is not the chief, but rather the devil himself. And this again draws us back to understanding the mysterious identity of our peasant, our dealer, and our chief, right? The fact that they all just appear out of nowhere throughout the story, without rhyme or reason, without really Pockham himself questioning where on earth they came from. And the fact that the dream reveals that all of these people are the devil in disguise should be fair warning to Pockham and to, to ourselves that the deal he's about to follow through with right, perhaps should be something he should be wary of instead, right, and wary particularly because his dream ends more like a nightmare, right, he sees this man lying flat on the ground, your text says prostrate, right, meaning that he's lying face in the dirt, and the only thing he has on now are his shirt and his pants or his trousers, and on closer inspection, we realize, and Pockham realizes, that this man is indeed himself, right? So what more of a warning does Pockham need that he needs to be careful in terms of his greed, right? That your greed is going to get you somewhere that you do not want to be. It's going to harm you physically. But unfortunately, just as we've always seen before, Pockham doesn't listen. And then finally, going to section seven, in terms of our analysis, we draw more conclusions about Pockham. And the first one that we draw is not just that he's greedy, but it, that his greed gets the best of him. And we see that in the fact that he goes to bed that evening, just even lulling himself to sleep with the thought of what he's going to do with all that land. But he doesn't even have it yet, right? He hasn't even completed the challenge and he's already planning what to do with it. So not just greed, but sort of this arrogance that everything is going to work out for him. And additionally, speaking to his greed, he states in his thoughts that he's going to give the best land to himself, right, a majority of the land, by the way, and the worst of it, even at a, a cost, to peasants. And speaking of our peasants, right, we need to remember that this is where Pockham came from in the beginning, right, he was a peasant, and now he's risen in the ranks, and instead, he treats those people beneath him not with respect and kindness as we would think, situational irony, but rather with contempt. And we see this in the way not only uh, that he forces his servant to sleep outside, right, again, not addressing him, making him sleep in the wagon, but also the fact that he gives the worst of this land to the peasants, right, not even thinking about the fact that he used to be there not too long ago. That is going to be it for our discussion today. So we're going to be picking up in our next video with the remainder of the short story. We only have a few more sections to go. So before watching the next video, I'd like everyone to make sure that they read the remainder of the short story. So either pages 968 to 971 in your literature textbook, or just the rest of the PDF copy that I'll post on Google Classroom also with this video. Please do make sure that you take notes as you read. Okay? Because for this short story in particular, once we're done, I'm going to have you guys write an essay in terms of how we see the theme of the story communicated, and in particular, 
how we see that theme communicated through the use of irony, foreshadowing, and those conclusions that we've been drawing about Pockham. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.